Yeah, I'm uh, Preston Manning. I'm currently the uh, president of the Manning Center for Building Democracy. Uh, we try to provide training to people that want to get into the political business. Great. And Mr. Manning, how important do you think carbon capture and storage is to this whole issue of managing greenhouse gas emissions? Well, I think it's an important uh, mechanism. It's clear that uh, when you burn hydrocarbons, you produce, well, you, uh, produces a lot of good on one hand. It has negative environmental consequences on the other. One is the uh, uh, production of CO2. Well, what are we going to do about that? One mechanism for dealing with it is uh, a carbon capture and storage. Now, how to organize that is uh, a huge question, but uh, there's no doubt in my mind that it should be on the uh, on the agenda. But, uh, what special challenges does this present for the oil industry in particular, or, or for for c the coal industry, for example? Well, because of the uh, public concern with respect to uh, that subject and the governmental concern, uh, industry uh, simply has to deal with it, and. Uh, I would broaden it out, though, beyond uh, climate change. I would I would start at the other end. I said, when you uh, uh, burn hydrocarbons, and we do it for to produce economic and social benefits, it's not being done for fun, and nobody's saying that that's not important. We have produced negative environmental consequences. That is the case with every good we produce, every form of energy we develop and use. And uh, for years and years, we've neglected that other stream of the environmental consequences. And now people are developing a consciousness, particularly younger people, that we have to deal with that other stream. We, we have to measure it and meter it and uh, figure out some way of avoiding it or mitigating it. And we have to figure out what it costs and we have to get the cost into the price of the good. And uh, that's the broad context in which I see this whole discussion of carbon pricing and mechanisms like carbon capture and storage as one way of dealing with one of those negative outputs. So I think you have some thoughts about how um, we provide the right signals or incentives or whatever the word you want to use to get rid of that carbon or to capture it, use it, do whatever with it. Um, what are your thoughts about the mechanisms? How do we do that? How do we create that, that environment where well, that well, happens? Well, I, I think instinctively, political people, if you had a psychiatrist's couch here and laid a politician down on it, uh, no matter what party, and said the words environmental conservation, uh, the first word that would come into their mind, if you asked them just what comes into your mind, that they would say regulation or legislation, that, that, that that's what elected people produce at the end of the day, <laughs> rules and or laws and regulation. And, and certainly there's a, ro a role for regulation and legislation for dealing with environmental conservation. But my argument is that you've got to harness more than just that horse to the environmental conservation cart or you'll never get to your objective. The other big horse that can be uh, harnessed to that cart is our market mechanisms themselves. Uh, pricing, uh, full cost accounting, uh, uh, private capital and ingenuity as well as public uh, ingenuity and capital. And uh, I think if you've got those two horses, the market and the government, hooked to environmental conservation, in this case dealing with the negative consequences of burning hydrocarbons, you've got a better chance of uh, having conservation occur than if you're just uh, harnessing one horse. And so how do you harness the market side of that equation? Well, one of the starts, and that, that's one place to start, is with attaching a price. Uh, on water conservation, for example, uh, you know, the government could send out an email to 30 million Canadians every morning saying, be careful how much water you use because it's not unlimited. You attach a price to water, and every person you know, turns on a tap uh, or sticks a pipe into a river or a lake or a reservoir is going to get a signal that this is not unlimited and it does uh, it, it has a value and uh, I think pricing mechanisms are one way of uh, uh, achieving a consciousness of the environmental consequences we're doing that has to be harnessed to this task of, of conservation. Any thoughts as to how to do that? 
Well, there's a variety of uh, proposals for doing that with respect to carbon, establishing a carbon price. I think a huge mistake was made by calling it a tax because <laughs> the public hate the idea of taxation and they don't believe politicians when they tell them that this money will go for that uh, uh, purpose. But I think establishing a price for carbon is one way of moving in this direction. How it's done is what the big debate is about. Uh, but that's one place to start. And there are other mechanisms to uh, harness the market as well. Are there are others that stand out for you? Well, I, I focus on, uh, on uh, full cost accounting. Uh, let's figure out the, what the real cost of producing a product or an energy form is. It's not just what we normally used to think of as the extraction, the production, the distribution cost. There's also this cost of dealing with the negative environmental impact. So full cost accounting is one mechanism, pricing is another. Developing mechanisms, public-private partnerships that harness private uh, capital, uh, all groups that want environmental conservation that go to the government and think that if we're going to get all this money to do all these things, to conserve our watersheds, to conserve our airsheds, to deal with all these uh, uh, negative environmental consequences, and that the governments are going to pay for it all, it's simply not possible. We've got to find ways of harnessing private capital and private investment. Uh, just as one follow-up, uh, you mentioned full cost accounting and, and you know I think if you talk across, you sit across the table with my brother-in-law for example and you were to say we should have full cost accounting and we should that's how the system should determine the price that sort of thing and we should account for the, the problems that are caused by any product or, or business we happen to be in. Um, I think my brother-in-law wouldn't be alone in saying, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. But in a highly politically charged environment of energy plus governments, how do you do that? I mean, there's nothing more political than energy and governments. And that's what we're talking about here. So how do you get a full cost accounting that's real? In, in well, I think one place to start is with pilot projects. To set, these are broad, big concepts. Uh, no one's quite sure how they would work out right. in practice. And you can see a reluctance on the part of the public to embrace some concept they're not sure uh, that they understand, you're not sure what all the consequences are, you can't answer all their questions. But to start out with pilot projects in, in small areas, specific uh, uh, issues, and see if full cost accounting and pricing contributes towards the solution, be able to publicize and communicate the results, uh, I, think, uh, I think pilot projects are one way to go. That's one reason I've advocated that in addition to think tanks, in this environmental area, I think we need conservation do tanks that would uh, would take some of these ideas and uh, organize them into pilot projects and manage the pilot project and communicate the results. So, that so if uh, sustainability is your guide and perhaps full cost accounting, where are we trying to get to? Well, well I, I think ultimately we're trying to get to uh, energizing our society, our, uh, our economy, uh, heating our homes and energizing everything we do in the way that is least damaging to the environment and in a way that is actually sustainable in, in the long run. And uh, as I said at the beginning, I think that involves uh, taking into account that negative stream, environmental stress stream that is associated with virtually everything we do and avoiding it if we can, mitigating it if we must, and uh, finding alternatives uh, if that's the way to resolve it. Does that mean we might leave some of our natural fossil fuels in the ground uh, if we find solutions quicker or? Well, it may be, or we may shift ultimately. Some people think we may end up with a hydrogen economy if the technologies uh, uh, permit that. Uh, the world is currently consuming 84 million barrels of oil a day with that projected to rise to 100 million barrels per day at some point in the future. So if we're going to get off that form of energy or e e even meet a fraction of those demands in the future, an awful lot of work has to be done on both the energy side and the environmental conservation side and in the near term. Mr. Manning, is there anything else you'd like to say? Or is no, there... I think that pretty well does it. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you.